permission to talk to talk today. So within this talk, I want to um, uh, lay out some of the challenges we're facing in safety assurance with the current generation of systems we're developing. In particular, I'm going to focus on the topic of uncertainty and also um, what are the root causes of uncertainty? What type of approaches are available to address uncertainty? And maybe what could be the way forward to nevertheless develop systems where uncertainty plays a role, but nevertheless um, develop enough confidence um, in these systems that we can safely deploy them in our environment. So uh, let's start off uh, with some definitions, first of all. So as Chris mentioned, I'm director at the Institute for Cognitive Systems in Munich. What do we mean by cognitive systems? Well, within this context, the type of systems we um, are involved with are systems that are, first of all, software intensive technical systems that somehow have to imitate um, the capabilities such as perception, learning, and reasoning. These systems can be found in, for example, automated driving, but also industrial robotics, driverless trains, and medical devices as well. When we look at um, electronic software intensive systems of the past and look at the, the traditional approach to, to addressing safety of these systems, we typically talk about functional safety. And functional safety defined in terms of the absence of unreasonable risk due to hazards caused by malfunctioning behavior of the system. What's implied there is that something is somehow broken in the system, causes some malfunction of the system, and that somehow leads to a hazardous situation and uh, risk maybe to, to people's lives. The types of malfunctions typically considered are random hardware errors, but also systematic errors. They could be in the hardware as, as well, but also in the software, for example, classic software bugs. So when we look at um, this current generation of cognitive systems we're currently developing, with increased level of um, automation, working in ever, ever more open contexts. Um, what's changing then? So first of all, what's changing is that these systems are being deployed within an environment which is very hard to specify. It has um, a huge scope and uh, exhibits very unpredictable behavior. So the picture here shows uh, some type of chaotic traffic scene that we all know from our morning commutes. And it's very hard to predict somehow which events could cause these types of um, traffic jams to appear, etc. Secondly, uh, these systems, they have to somehow make sense of this very complex, very unpredictable environment based on a set of sensors, right? So we need to turn this physical world into a digital world. And these sensors are also not perfect. Then they, they introduce some inaccuracies and noise that may be poorly calibrated. Um, they may only have limited resolution as well. So these sensors um, and our approach to sensing the environment also um, include some type of uncertainty involved there. And lastly, what's our solution at the moment? Well, let's... Uh, uh, get clever and uh, apply things like machine learning to try to make sense of this very large amount of unstructured data. So uh, techniques such as machine learning themselves um, also, as we'll see, don't give a precise answer to the question. They can introduce more types of uncertainties um, themselves. So in other words, um, instead of just looking at the way individual components break, we have different levels of additional challenges we're trying to face. And these challenges I'm going to elaborate on now in more detail. And to do so, I'm going to start off with an example. This example you, you may well be familiar with, and this is, is an example as a, I'm not using this example to, to shame the company involved, but it's just a very well-documented and analyzed example. This is the example of the Uber temper accident, which involved um, a collision between a prototype automated driving vehicle and a pedestrian. And what you can see here from the, from the accident report from the NTSB is basically an analysis of what happened in the seconds leading up to the crash. 
what what you can see here in the table is effectively what the vehicle was doing is every several seconds, the leader and radar components were reclassifying this object that they could see in the road. So sometimes the radar would classify it as a vehicle. Sometimes um, the LIDAR would uh, classify it as a, as a pedestrian. Each time this reclassification occurred, there was a reset of the trajectory planning and therefore the information was somehow lost. What happened is this kept occurring until very um, shortly before the impact, at which case the, um, the accident couldn't be prevented. So this type of failure is something that we call um, failure of the intended functionality. It wasn't actually um, directly caused by a very specific software bug or a broken piece of hardware, but more about some insufficiencies in the designs of the algorithms and the types of sensor sets that were being used as well. However, on top of this, what we saw is that, so these types of insufficiencies are somehow uncovered by certain situations. So this situation of the, the pedestrian pushing a bicycle across this road was something the system was obviously not defined for. This type of situation we define as a trivial condition. But on top of that, there were other factors uh, at play here, most predominantly human factors. So actually, this was a, a, a test vehicle, and uh, there was a, a test driver within the vehicle whose task it was to supervise the vehicle and to engage um, if the vehicle were to miss any, um, miss any uh, type of um, situation that it should have been responding to. So it was the, the test driver's responsibility to actually break, um, monitor the road ahead and um, avoid the accident. She was unfortunately um, watching content on her mobile phone and uh, failed to, to monitor the system uh, correctly. This is an effect that we often refer to as automation complacency. She had driven around this circuit a number of times. Every time it seemed to work okay, and at some point boredom set in and uh, she became distracted. But still, there were other factors at play here. So for example, from a management perspective, okay, we have to uh, um, question the type of engineering processes involved that led to the system having these types of insufficiencies and lack of maturity uh, while it was being tested on the road but also lack of oversight of the safety driver. Then you know, there was issues raised about training and, and oversight of the safety driver. Also the motivation involved in, in rewarding um, uh, the, the performance of the test driver, et cetera. But the accident report didn't stop there. It also went one step further and questioned actually the way these types of vehicles were being regulated in the, in the state of Arizona. And um, they questioned uh, whether or not there was an adequate set of regulations in place to prevent these types of accidents happening. And what we can see is actually this, this accident was a combination of a lot of these different factors. So it's very hard to blame just one particular factor, but it's a good example of, of how these, uh, these factors somehow combine and to provide some emergent um, situation which um, led to this accident. There were other factors involved here as well. So if you look at the the picture on the left-hand side, you can see what appears to be pathways joining these two carriageways. Actually, there weren't pathways at all, they were just decoration, but it could be assumed that the uh, pedestrian um, misinterpreted uh, these, this almost this decoration as a valid a place to cross the road where actually it was hazardous to do so. So this means that the type of, um, uh, type of failures we need to concern ourselves with nowadays are not just uh, restricted to individual component failures. They're what we refer to as systemic failures. So in other words, failures that only manifest themselves at the system level. And as a result of interactions between behaviors of different components um, within the system, but also between the system and its environment. And this can include not only technical aspects, but also interactions with um, aspects such as the management and operations of these systems, but also the regulatory control of these systems. So to summarize this introduction, um, it's my belief, my 
hypothesis is that safety is becoming less and less about what happens when individual technical components break and more about managing the emergent risk associated with increasing complexity of these systems. So what do I mean exactly by com complexity? So we can take a fairly academic uh, view of complexity. We often talk in a sort of lazy way about our systems becoming more complex or complicated. They're ever more bigger than, and there's more components involved. They're harder to, to, to develop, et cetera. What I mean here is actually uh, complex systems in terms of systems that exhibit behaviors that are somehow emergent properties of the individual parts of the system. And they're behaviors that could not be predicted based on knowledge of the parts of the systems and the interactions of those uh, parts of the systems alone. So somehow when I re refer to complex systems and complexity, it's really referring to this emergent behavior. And this emergent behavior can be caused by a number of different things. What we see in, and a study I'll reference further on in this, in this talk, where we analyzed a lot of the different causes for this type of emergent complexity, it can be due to, for example, what we call semi-permeable boundaries, where it's not exactly clear where the boundary of the system is. Where does the system end and where does the environment begin? If we're talking about automated driving vehicles, are we talking about just everything that's within the confines of the individual vehicle? Are we talking about the um, mobility infrastructure as a whole as a system? Obviously, complex systems, one of the typical properties is this somehow unpredictable um, non-deterministic behavior. So we can have this type of non-linear uh, type of approach, fast mode transitions, tipping points, there's a number of different definitions here. But also what we see is as we deploy systems with a certain level of automation and even autonomy, then we end up with a certain type of self-organization. This could be at a fairly, I'd say, trivial um, basis where we just see other systems and other humans adapting to the way these automated systems behave as well. But somehow that also changes the interaction between the system and its environment, and therefore could lead to this emergent non predicted behavior. And one of the consequences of this is what we call in the paper referenced here, the semantic gap. And the semantic gap really um, is a way of describing this um, lack of knowledge, this, this gap, which appears because we cannot predict uh, in, in total the behavior of our system. And effectively, the semantic gap is a discrepancy between our intended uh, behavior of the system and how we think the system should behave and will behave, and our ability to actually specify that functionality in detail. And this could be caused by the complexity and unpredictable and predictability of the operational domain, as I've recently just uh, explained. It can be due to the complexity and unpredictability of the system itself. And we'll see there And when I talk about uh, machine learning, uh, the way that can manifest itself within the system. But also importantly, and, and some, one of the things that is often overlooked technically is that these highly automated systems involve somehow transferring more and more of the decision function from, from the user or the operator to the system itself. And as we transfer this decision responsibility to the system, it means these gaps often occur because a lot of these decisions are often uh, made based on human intuition, some context regarding um, some understanding of, of typical uh, rules of the road, um, legal constraints, ethical constraints, et cetera, which are often very hard to encode in a technical spe specification. So these semantic gaps really are, 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 are a consequence of this increase in complexity and increase in automation we have. And these semantic gaps, this lack of knowledge can be described in another way. So another way of uh, describing lack of knowledge is uncertainty. And this gives us a little bit of a bridge to some of the more technical issues that we face here because uh, uncertainty is often used in a, in a technical sense and uh, we'll see that on the following slides. The definition I use here is, is a fairly 
uh, I'd say dogmatic uh, um, definition that says uncertainty is any deviation from this unachievable ideal um, level of completely deterministic knowledge of the relevant system. So in other words, what it's saying here is that we will never have 100% knowledge of the system. Uncertainty is the deviation from that 100% knowledge of the system. And therefore, what we're interested in is how much deviation in that knowledge we have, and what types of deviations do we have. So there are a lot of different ways in which uncertainty is currently being defined and used to discuss various issues uh, associated with the safety of these types of systems. So I call them here dimensions of uncertainty. There's different ontologies, different definitions we can use. So I've just picked out two different dimensions here, which I think are, are interesting. So first of all, we can talk about uncertainty in terms of where, um, where the uncertainty occurs. So it can occur in the environment, including uh, as I mentioned at the start, some unpredictable nature of the environment, which we just don't fully understand. There can be uncertainty in the goals we set on the system. So this is what's often called a specification uncertainty. In other words, it's very hard to define a, a precise specification. So there may be some gaps in our specification and a way of um, modeling the environment and what the system should do. There may be some model uncertainty. So in other words, the system typically has to um, develop a model of its environment and have some model of its environment at, at which it can react to. And there may be un uncertainty involved of how accurate that model is, how accurately the system can, can model its, the environment in which it's trying to control. As function uncertainty, which is often used to, to um, talk about uncertainty of specific system functions, which may have non-deterministic behavior or have unexpected um, side effects or develop some inaccuracies. Um, the use of machine learning is, is a good source of, of this type of uncertainty, as well as the model uncertainty. There's also uncertainty in terms of the resources the system use, uses. Maybe the resources are not always available. Maybe I don't always have the runtime um, uh, capacity available to do complex interactions. Right? Uh, maybe some parts of my system aren't available to me due to defects or other types of restrictions as well. So there's different ways in which uncertainty can manifest itself within the system. And at the same time, there's different ways of talking about different levels of uncertainty. So almost different, um, uh, different orders or magnitude of, of uncertainty, you can see it. So the first is, um, often termed as statistical uncertainty. So this is uncertainty that can somehow be quantitatively defined in statistical terms, right? So we can, we can um, model a probability distribution, right? Over a certain input signal we have, for example. Um, there's a type of uncertainty we have where we, we can't do that, but we can just limit the, this lack of knowledge to certain scenarios where we say, okay, well, there are certain situations that occur where we just don't have the knowledge available to, to ourselves whether or not the system behaves within according to, to our expectations or not. And that's typically more of a qualitative approach where we say, well, there are certain classes of situations we have just not tested the system in, um, haven't defined it in detail, or we're just un unsure about. And lastly, there's a the third level of uncertainty, which is a total lack of unaware, a lack of awareness that our knowledge is lacking. So this is our unknown unknowns, as Donald Rumsfeld uh, once called it. And this is very dangerous, obviously, because this isn't something that we can um, build mechanisms into the system to counteract. So it requires some sort of measures outside of the system as well. So I promise to give you some more detailed examples of uncertainty in the system, and, and one of which is is um, the uncertainty that the use of machine learning brings with it. So if machine learning is, is um, had a, a huge uh, boost in the last years uh, because of its potential applications for automated driving and in general automated systems control. However, machine learning actually illustrates a lot of these different types of uncertainty in, in a, um, various different ways. So first of all, 
the way machine learning use, works is instead of having a precise algorithmic specification of the function, we train our, our function based on a set of representative data points. So what that means is we often lack a detailed specification of the functionality. So in other words, how do we know what is the safe functionality or not? If we're not specifying the functionality and just somehow anecdotally specifying the functionality through training data, there's often a, a gap in, in the way we can define what is an acceptable level of uh, functionality uh, for safety. So these machine learning functions are obviously very sensitive to the training data that they were used. And if the environment changes over time, and that's not represented and not uh, um, reflected in the training data, then it can lead to uh, a degradation of functionality and performance over time, as we have what we call um, uh, distributional shift in the operational design domain. Another property of these machine learning functions is actually, if you look at them, and this picture actually shows it very, very nicely, these functions never give us 100% precise output. There's always some uncertainty in the functions. And what we also see is that we have a certain, there's always a number of residual errors in the functions. Um, we never have 100% uh, performance uh, uh, achievement in these functions. And this is caused by um, a lack of robustness to small changes in the input somehow, which for us as humans maybe don't make a difference, but just purely coincidentally because of the way the, the function has learned its, its relationships based on the input data, it can lead to, to big changes in the, in the system. And, uh, and also, um, as you can see in this picture, they never, never give us a, a straightforward answer. There's always some uncertainty. Uh, they, the function will say, okay, well, we believe it's 80% it's chance there's a person in front of us, but we can't be sure. And often that 80% chance is no, isn't a good reflection of the real probability of the function getting right. So machine learning actually introduces at the technical level, a lot of um, uncertainties, but it also opens questions up about how we specify such systems, how we determine whether or not they're performing correctly, what our expectations are, et cetera. So one of the ways to resolve this, and I won't go into details here, is the machine learning community and the machine learning safety community is looking at what the community is beginning to call safe MLOps. So in other words, how can we develop an iterative approach to developing these functions where we continuously try to understand what level of residual uncertainty is, is present in the function? What are the underlying causes of these uncertainties and residual errors? And can we define measures either by improving the training data or improving the design of the system or by having monitoring, redundancy, other types of architectural uh, approaches to minimize the impact of these residual errors and residual uncertainty? So this is a very sort of iterative approach that's beginning to, to be developed and applied here. Obviously, with the, with the, with the objective to actually um, end up with a realistic evaluation of the residual statistical and, uncert and scenario uh, uncertainty in the function um, that we have. So we can then make informed decisions as to how to integrate this ML function into a wider system context. Speaking of inter uh, integrating into a wider system context, at a technical level, another thing that we as systems engineers are looking at is what we call uncertainty quantification and also uncertainty propagation. What you can see here at the bottom is, is just some abstract definition of a system with different components that uh, somehow interact. And the inputs and outputs on those components both uh, contain some type of uncertainty and each component somehow has an uncertainty transformation function inherent with it. So in other words, based on the uncertainty in the inputs, it produces some uncertainty on the outputs. And if we analyze the propagation of those uncertainty transformers, we'll end up with um, some type of um, uncertainty in the final output of the system. This, uh, if we had to apply these types of techniques, this would allow us to, first of all, have a good level of uncertainty estimation of these individual components and be able to determine these uncertainty transformation functions in some way. 
Then one of the things that um, there's current uh, research into is what type of design patterns can be applied to minimize the uncertainty. So can we uh, use this information to somehow um, reduce the amount of uncertainty that propagates through the system? If we could do so, then maybe we could relax some of the worst case assumptions we make about the system by making, making use of this uncertainty somehow within the operation of the system and to determine at runtime when we're in a situation where maybe a high level of uncertainty occurs and uh, in all other systems we can maybe maximize the utilization of the system and maximize the functionality we can achieve. This type of approach however is only applicable to um, situations where we do have a measure of quantifiable uncertainty so in other words uh, uncertainty falling under this category of statistical uncertainty that for example that could be represented by a Gaussian distribution on the inputs or the outputs there's some examples here that i've just added as references so if we look at the um the iso guide um on expressing uncertainty there's a lot of information in there also approaches such as um inverse variance weighting some of the Kalman filter type approaches can, can support here as well. But as I say, this is limited and re requires, to, requires you to have a technical understanding of the statistical uncertainty of the components. So another way of treating uncertainty in, in systems is what the research community calls self-adaptive systems. And self-adaptive systems are systems that provide some sort of resilience against faults and uncertainties within the system itself, but also resilience against changes and uncertainties in the environment. The difference here between a normal system, which would just directly interact with its environment, is an additional layer of functionality, which um, uses uh, information about the system, but also information about the environment to determine a set of conditions under which the controlling system needs to be adaptive, uh, adapted in order to maintain some level of, of residual risk and some level of safety. So this seems like a, a neat idea and there's a lot of research going on here and also within our institute as well. However, these types of systems also give us uh, a certain number of uh, challenges in terms of how do we actually argue the safety of these types of self-adaptive systems? So there's different definitions here I've taken from the paper that uh, is referenced below um, regarding things like perpetuous assurance. So how do we ensure that we continually stay safe even if the system is adapting? So typically our safety assurance would take place before we release the system into the environment. If the system then keeps changing and adapting itself, how do we make sure it's, it's still safe? There needs to be some sort of overreaching framework at a, at a more meta level that would argue that however the system is adapted is going to be an adapted in a safe way and that's a, a difficult task. There's also um, the question of um, uh, how do we actually define these observation points? How do we understand, how do we monitor, how do we detect when this system is somehow operating outside of its limits and not operating correctly as well because if we could solve that problem maybe we could design a better system in the, in the first place so uh, to summarize um, this section there's a lot of different types of uncertainties that we encounter in these types of sy uh, systems that all provide challenges to safety assurance and i've mentioned some of them here related to uncertainty in the specification of the system some of the technical uncertainty involved in different components of the system, um, but also uncertainty involved in the assurance of the system, whether or not we really trust our safety assurance. And what we see at the moment is there's a number of methods being defined um, that can be applied at design time for trying to counteract these uncertainties um, in terms of, for example, using standardized domain ontologies, um, doing some sort of validation of the system in silent mode, so sort of running the system in parallel, but not actually uh, hot, as it were, or live, to try to get a better understanding of the environment it's going to be working in. Some of the uncertainty quantification analysis techniques are described as well, but also different ways of, of trying to express our confidence in our assurance case as well, using different belief systems, etc. 
There's also approaches that have been defined at operation time or runtime. So typical approaches such as technical redundancy and monitoring would be a classic one, um, but also looking at runtime uncertainty quantification, which was hinted at in, in the last slide as well. Also the self-adaptation and dynamic risk management I talked about, but also dynamic assurance cases, which basically um, are assurance arguments where certain parts of the evidence can be adapted and updated at runtime to either close, close off residual gaps in the argument or, or highlight where the, maybe where the argument is no longer valid. And what I'm trying to show in this slide is actually there's a, at the moment there's like a, a huge buffet of different definitions of uncertainty and different approaches that can be applied here. Um, and these are all at a rather technical level. And I just want to take one step back before moving into the conclusions part of my talk. What I've been talking about um, in the last few slides are sort of technical approaches to trying to address uncertainty and identify different sources of uncertainty, which we would apply as part of a safety assurance process, which is a very sort of engineering focused um, uh, viewpoint as well. So in other words, uh, what we would like to achieve as safety engineers is a set of systematic processes and methods and tools for collecting evidence that our system requirements are met and that they meet clearly defined and measurable criteria, for example, for trustworthy AI-based systems. Um, the question actually society wants us to answer is, what impact will this system have on overall risk in a certain operational domain? And what we see at the moment is uh, regulations being developed at the EU level for trustworthy AI, for example, that define a set of properties such as um, you know, technical robustness and safety, maybe that's, that can be dealt with technically, but also things like transparency, diversity, fairness, societal well-being, accountability, human agency and oversight. We need to ensure that our systems somehow maintain these properties that have been defined. But at the moment, what we see, there's a gap between the way we technically define the systems, the type of technical arguments we have, and the types of attributes and properties society and the regulations want these systems to have. So there's, there's, there's uh, an additional challenge there of somehow bridging that gap as well. So I'm gonna uh, start to, to, to wrap up now. Um, so basically um, uh, this quote from Douglas Adams uh, puts it, puts my position as a safety engineer quite nicely in context. So basically you say there's this theory that uh, universe, that if anybody discovers what the universe is for, it will instantly disappear and be replaced by something even more inexplicable. As a safety engineer, this is the way I feel about the way autonomous systems are, are adapted. As soon as we somehow manage to, to um, come up with a set of techniques to ensure the safety and explain the safety of, of one type of system, the systems become somehow more complex and unmanageable. So that means with this increase in automation within the open context, the use of machine learning, et cetera, we need to make sure that we continuously adapt our system engineering processes and our safety assurance processes to somehow adapt to these challenges to maintain uh, a certain level of residual risk and safety. Because these safety arguments will only be as strong as the confidence um, in the information they rely on. Um, so unless, unless we somehow minimize and control the uncertainty within this safety assurance process, we're not going to be able to come up with a strong argument um, that these systems are safe enough. And therefore, we also won't be able to explain that we meet the properties that were explained on the other the slide and we won't be able to achieve the societal expectations we achieve. So what we see that there's a need here to somehow bring some of these strands together that I mentioned. So at the moment, there's this there's, there's a lot of different um, uh, definitions of uncertainty. There's a lot of different understanding of, of measures we can apply to reduce uncertainty. We need to somehow bring them together. And it's not only me thinking this way as well. There's other researchers looking in, into this in detail. And I've just added two, two papers here as reference as well. So we see this as, as like a, an emergent um, safety engineering discipline where we have to somehow bring together um, system safety engineering, uh, some of the work on uncertainty quantification, self-adaptive systems, um, 
AI and safety of machine learning, as well as maybe with some of the more social technical con, uh, con, um, contexts as well. And um, this isn't something that's going to be able to be done immediately in one step. So uh, we feel like this is going to have to take some bootstrapping, right? So how do we bootstrap uh, our trust in these types of systems? And we see this somehow occurring naturally where as we deploy automated driving, actually we don't have full level four automated driving on the roads. We're deploying them somehow piece by piece. The regulation is, is catching up bit by bit. So if we look at the ALKS type regulation uh, involved, some of the work that different governments are looking at in terms of um, traffic jam pilots and delivery drones and low, um, uh, low speed automated um, people carriers and these sort of things. And I believe we'll need this sort of bootstrapping process to do so, to start this process, we'll need some calibrated level of tolerable re residual risk. So even with the most simple systems, we need to define, okay, what is an acceptable level of risk? And I see systems get more complex and develop and the environment in which they are deployed becomes more and more open. How do we ensure that this level of tolerable risk is, is maintained? And we can do that from a technical perspective, obviously, and you'll recognize this schematic here. It's deliberately uh, there to, to invoke the adaptive systems uh, paradigm I showed earlier, where you would have some way of continuously assuring the technical system based on set technical risk indicators we can monitor in the field as well. But we also see the need to actually apply a similar approach to ensure that the regulation and the safety management procedures we're applying are also appropriate to the task in hand. So we also need to define a way of how do we monitor whether the, the regulations we're defining, safety management systems we're using to, to manage the deployment of these systems, how do we ensure that they're adequate as well? And we need to somehow work out how to, how to, how to define um, these behavioral observation points to understand whether or not our approach to deploying these systems, despite all of this uncertainty, is appropriate, and whether whether or not we really are managing to reduce this residual uncertainty in the system. So I'd just like to now wrap up with some ongoing research questions. As you've probably guessed, I've probably or hopefully um, raised a lot more questions than I have answered. As a researcher, this is what I like to do as a, uh, as a living, because I like to um, provide uh, work for my research team to do. And there's a lot of open research questions here um, that we're working on within our institute, but also other institutes um, and other research organizations are currently working on. These are things such as the definition of these risk acceptance criteria for such uh, types of systems. Some of the more ethics and um, uh, social technical aspects we also look at in collaboration with um, AI ethicists and philosophers as well to help us bridge that gap between the ethical and societal expectations and these technical criteria we can actually design our system against. But also there's still a lot of open questions related to the role of quantitative and qualitative evidence in, in assuring the safety of these types of systems. Um, where does the quantitative evidence we can collect, where does it have its limits? Um, what type of um, statistical, statistical confidence can we really achieve there for these types of very complex systems? Um, where do we need to rely on qualitative arguments? And some of the other topics related to uncertainty propagation and, and the safety assurance of self-adaptive systems have also already mentioned in, in the talk as well. So to wrap up, um, to some short statements to provoke a discussion. Um, I believe that quantitative arguments alone in terms of trying to reduce statistical uncertainty, although they're a prerequisite, they certainly won't be sufficient um, to um, come up with a sufficient level of safety assurance in these systems. Uh, we need to take a more holistic view of the systems. We need to take a step back. We need to look at the systems from a so-called system level minus one view and look at the context in which the system has been uh, uh, deployed, 
and try to understand what are the underlying causes of complexity and uncertainty in the system, not only at a technical level, but also at a management, operational and um, regulatory level as well. So somehow we need an assurance process that embraces or somehow acknowledges these sources of uncertainty and complexity. What we do see is there are very clear indications that um, sort of DevOps types approaches, so continuous development type approaches will be a key here to try to continuously uncover um, and minimize residual uncertainties in the system. The question is there, how do we do a safe bootstrapping process there? And as part of that safe bootstrapping process, we'll need to have some sort of successive um, approach to um, starting off with fixed scenarios we understand very well and can validate the system in and successively um, expanding uh, the scope in which we deploy the system to try to um, manage this emergent complexity and, and uncertainty to, to sort of um, calibrate uh, the complexity of the, of, the, of the system and its uh, environment with our capabilities to argue safety as well. So there will inevitably need to be some sort of scenario-based iterative approach to introducing these systems. So that's it. Uh, uh, last of all, just to summarize, um, to understand um, the, the path to safe, highly automated um, um, AI-based cyber physical systems, it's essential to acknowledge sources of uncertainty within the safety assurance process. As you've seen, I don't have the definitive answers yet, uh, which means it's gonna keep me in a job for the next few years, which is a nice thing. But there's a number of, uh, number of areas we can start to get our teeth into. What's important though is, is that we start to bring these different types of understanding uh, of uncertainty and the measures together to form a holistic view of the system and its environment um, and to allow us to manage this emergent risk of ever more complex systems. It's a very complex topic, obviously. This has just been a very quick uh, insight and a provocative presentation to hopefully raise more questions and, than answers. And I'm very much looking forward to your questions and, and feedback. Thank you very much. Thanks, Simon, for a great presentation. Let's look over the questions. We have two of them. Uh, there's a third one from Ruland, which he posted in the chat. So maybe I start with the one from Ruland. Um, thanks for your talk, Simon. Which formal or semi-formal models could we include as machine learning output to the current uh, certification homologation process onboard site? Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm, I'm trying to uh, interpret this uh, question. So first of all, hi, Roland. Uh, it's I assume that's Roland Galvez. I uh, um, hope you're doing well. So uh, in the end, um, I think there's going to be a combination of techniques. So in the safety standard for AI, I'm currently uh, leading. What we will see, there'll be a mixture of quantitative approaches in terms of trying to quantify uncertainty in the residual uh, function, um, which will hopefully increase our confidence in uh, the results we have and our estimation of residual errors and the types of situations these, these residual errors can occur in. But there will also be qualitative approaches which will be defining um, development processes, um, verification and validation and analysis techniques. One of the things we're looking at uh, very closely in, in the standard at the moment is what we call a causal model of insufficiencies in the system. So really trying to understand as safety engineers have a tendency to do. Yeah? We all know FMEAs, FTAs, uh, ETAs, choose whatever you like. Um, we, we try to understand what failures can occur and what can be the root causes of those failures. So we can select effective measures to either prevent those failures occurring in the first place or somehow limit the impact of those failures. And that is as a sort of qualitative analysis technique. That is also something that's coming into the standard and we can see as maybe like a semi-formal safety analysis that can be um, uh, seen as there. That's something that's currently under development and obviously needs to be paired up with some sort of uh, 
set of quantitative approaches and KPIs and metrics to actually to use as, as references there as well. So it's going to be a mixture of, of, set, uh, of topics. I do believe the topic of uncertainty, quantification and propagation, as, as I mentioned here on this one slide, that will play a role as well as these more sort of qualitative safety analysis techniques. Okay, let's have a look at the question and answer mm -hmm. menu. Um, feel free to pick uh, the question you like. We have four of them. Um, yeah, so uh, let's start um, at the non-technical level because I, that's something I'm, you know, I'm, I'm also involved in. Um, uh, there's the example I showed as well. I deliberately illustrated what went wrong in the Uber accident as layers of, of failures, right? And you could argue that the root cause was a lack of um, adequate regulation of the system. So in the end, you know, the politicians right, in the laws, uh, they're there to protect us from unreasonable risk, right? They're there to protect society. So um, there's, um, it's very important that um, the people writing regulations and laws at the moment for these types of systems understand these, these um, root causes of complexity and understand the limits of current approaches to regulation. Um, and this is something that we're working on, thinking about how, how regulation can be developed in future um, to be slightly more agile. That's something I, I had in one of my last slides where I had that analogy of the sort of self-adaptive system model at a regulatory level. So the regulation itself has to continuously somehow monitor itself and understand, okay, how, how effective are we? This is very closely related to the topic of liability that was mentioned here as well. So one of the reasons that the EU is coming up with this AI directive is to try to reduce some of the legal responsibility gaps we have at the moment, where there's somehow sort of gaps between um, the kind of ways that, that laws are formulated and our technical abilities to implement those laws. Actually, if we look at the Uber Temper uh, situation as well, it was very hard to, to, to assign blame in that situation. And um, if you look at the paper I referenced um, in the presentation called Mind the Gaps, we also explain how the semantic gaps lead to liability gaps and so lead to a, um, an ambiguity who is actually responsible for the system. So one answer to that is also how to close the semantic gaps to how to, uh, uh, to reduce some of these liability gaps. There's some information in that paper related to the way tort law is currently practiced and uh, laid out that might be interesting uh, for, for Alex to take a look at as well there. But uh, key here is what Alex mentions here. It's this transfer of the decision function from the person to the machine. And in transferring that so-called decision function, what we find is, you know, there's a difference between, you know, transferring the decision to uh, turn the toaster off when my, when my bread is, is, is sufficiently toasted. That's that decision I can somehow specify in a nice amount of detail with a model of, of uh, the heat uh, developing within the case of my toaster, et cetera. Transferring the decision of when to avoid certain obstacles, how to behave in ambiguous situations uh, in an automated driving situation, that's way harder to, to describe. So on that, on that way to specifying that decision function, a lot of things get somehow lost by the way side, right? And that these gaps occur, and that is what leads to these liability gaps. And the important thing there is to try to understand where those gaps occur and how they can be closed. And, and there needs to be some sort of, um, and this is why I say it's a bootstrapping approach, some sort of collaborative a, a way of developing the systems, understanding some of these issues better, and um, adapting the regulation and, and the laws to, to achieve that, which is why, unfortunately, however much of a technology optimist I am um, and working in this area for the last few years, 
you know, we're not going to have this huge leap where all of a sudden from today to tomorrow, we're going to have very highly automated systems, um, you know, permeating our, our live, lives. It's going to be a, take, a, take a while to get that just so that we can close some of these questions. So um, uh, maybe, um, uh, am I allowed to pick out some questions, uh, Chris? Yes. Or would you like to pick out some questions? No, okay, just right. pick, pick uh, the one you like. Okay, so I'll, I'll quickly um, uh, uh, switch over. So first of all, I, I agree. Um, I agree with Rudiger's uh, comments. Yeah. So um, um, uh, uh, so um, I, I think the question of of Jörg, uh, whether or not um, uh, automated driving can be based on deterministic foundations, yes or no. It's it's a question of of how deterministic do you want to be, right? So if we go back to my definition of uncertainty, where uncertainty is any deviation from the absolute truth, right? We we'll always have uncertainty in our system, and so the question here is, how much uncertainty can we allow? Are we aware of how much uncertainty is in the system? So. Um, these systems are typically deterministic. What the problem is, we don't have a deterministic model of the environment. So we don't have a deterministic way of predicting when these so-called triggering conditions will occur in the environment. So if they do occur, if the exactly the same set of situations occurs, then the system will typically behave deterministically. But somehow we, we don't have a good way of, of guessing when these types of triggering conditions uh, will occur. And especially with these so-called unknown triggering conditions, we can just estimate maybe how many unknown triggering conditions are still um, present within certain classes of scenarios, right? So there's, the, it's, so in other words, uh, in, instead of addressing the topic of determinism, yes or no, for me, it's more of a question of how much uncertainty can we get away with and, and how much we can live with? Um, I think um, in um, uh, with respect to, to Stuart's uh, question, do we have any real understanding of human cognition? I, that's a very difficult question as well. And it's not something I'm not sure whether we necessarily need to answer in order to assure the safety of the systems. There's, there's always the danger of having too close a comparison between the human and the machine. So there's a uh, there's chance of, it's a very difficult word, I'll try to pronounce it, philanthropization. So in other words, try sort of projecting human characteristics onto the, onto the machine at hand. And actually the automated vehicles or robots and other types of machinery we have, typically their perception capabilities themselves are many orders of, of magnitude better than a human, right? We have eyes that keep blinking, uh, which are blurry, um, that uh, don't always look in the right place. Uh, we're uh, distracted, so we don't actually have a full level two level of concentration in line with our level one level of thinking. Sort of automated sensors we have, much more diverse approach. We can have like 360 uh, degree sensing. The problem there is somewhere else. It, it's somehow making sense of this information where that's where the human is much better as well. So it's very hard to, to make this comparison. And it's very hard to, to use comparison at that level. Uh, for example, the level of human sensing to actually use as an adequate benchmark, I think, because th there's so much else that's involved. So um, I could scan the questions and, and uh, uh, that, so maybe, yeah, Stuart's question is, is a good one. Yes, uh, it, it, th there is the problem of, of how these systems are sold, right? Um, and this is something that um, is also uh, a matter of great debate. So yes, at the moment, the systems are sold as being better than the human. And depending on the manufacturer, that is done in quite an aggressive manner with um, I'd say uh, a, a particular interpretation of how statistics work, right? The question is, 
which human do we want to be better than? And is being just better than the human good enough? And how do we measure that? So in other words, what is the nominator and denominator of that question of that equation, right? If we're looking for a failure rate, right? What set of situations do we do we count? Is it an averaged out failure rate across all possible scenarios? And therefore, if we took that, we could be way, way, way better than a human in almost all scenarios. But for certain critical scenarios, let's say in a very chaotic situation outside a, outside a high school where parents have got parked their vehicles in awkward places, you've got small kids running around. Statistically, that's only a small number of the time of day where that occurs and a small number of uh, parts of the of the roadmap, etc. But if we don't get that right, right, there's that's certainly not going to be acceptable, right. So there's when we talk about these trade offs um, and this so called positive risk balance, we have to be very careful that um, we have to do that in some sort of balanced manner. And if we look at some of these AI trustworthiness aspects, such as a lack of discrimination. Uh, fairness, they could be used also to enhance that type of, of, of trade-off um, that's um, being made as well. So uh, it, it's certainly not a, an easy question. And I think we, we need a set of criteria uh, and also a set of standardized scenarios for you to, to actually answer that question. Just time is ticking. Yep. We are late. Um, if you want to answer one last question, feel free. Otherwise, yep. or I just need to close the session. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, let me try to do very, go through very quickly, right? Um, the very last question, yes, interval ma methods for uncertainty quantification, something we're looking at as well. So that's one of the uh, calculation techniques that can be used. The question there is, is how to um, use an, an interval-based arithmetic to actually to do that. Um, uncertainty propagation. So yes, that's something um, uh, we've also be, been looking at. Um, the topic of self-adaptive systems, I think is a longer answer. Um, I've referenced a, a quite a neat paper that I wasn't involved in. So it's, uh, it's not selling anything I've done um, in, on, the, on the page on self-adaptive systems, which summarizes some of the um, assurance challenges involved in self-adaptive systems. I share the opinions of the authors uh, as well. And I think there's some interesting work that can be done there as well. So, so hopefully I've answered as, as uh, some of your questions. And uh, um, yeah, thanks very much for the very interesting questions and the opportunity to talk. It was a pleasure having you. Um, so thank you for attending. We hope you enjoyed this talk. Good luck and goodbye. See you. Thank you very Somehow. much. Bye bye. Okay, so uh, do I leave now, or do you want to give a, a quick uh, introduction to what's coming next on your agenda? And I'll just. Uh, and we and have see. nothing scheduled next. We okay. are just in the planning, and we will see in August what we try to publish. Um, it's um, not uh, not not ready now. Okay. 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 Well, thank you everybody for attending the talk. Thank you again for the questions. And it was uh, my pleasure. I'm glad my, my, my voice held out and that was, uh, I could be understood. Thank you very much. And have a good evening or rest of the day, wherever you are. Thank you. Bye. Bye.